Um, as Jared said, uh, the topic tonight is a man after God's own heart. Uh, what do you think of when you think of that phrase? Uh, or maybe, you know, who do you think of? And Jared talked about it already. Obviously, you know, our mind autom- automatically goes to David. Um, David's the one that's kind of been attributed um, or been kind of, um, that's who that phrase is about. And uh, kind of like he said, you know, the life of David is very fascinating to me. Um, I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying the Sunday school lessons we're going through right now, um, looking, at, looking at Saul and then David and now this morning Absalom. I'm assuming you are going through the same Sunday school book as we are, um, but I've really enjoyed that. It's been really, really fascinating to me. Um, with that in mind, I wasn't sure maybe where to go tonight uh, with the topic kind of along the lines of David again. Um, but uh, tonight we are going to look at just a few different aspects, a few different examples um, from the story, from the life of David. And I guess kind of what I want to pull out of that is just notice how his example is, as being that man after God's own heart. Um, I want that to encourage all of us, you know, as, as God's people, um, to be... Um, to encourage us to be to live a life seeking God more deeply and uh, draw our hearts closer to the heart of God. Um, so what is a man after God's own heart? Um, or for us today, you know, what is involved in becoming that, that man after God's own heart? Um, this phrase is found twice in the Bible, um, once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, and it's both, both times it's referring to David. Uh, if you have your Bibles out, you can turn with me. I'm going to look at both of those, both of those times it's mentioned. Um, the first time is in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, um, and then also Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Um, so you can turn to both of, those, both of those references, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, and Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I'll start with the one here in 1 Samuel 13, uh, verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And this is, this is Samuel here talking to David, or sorry, talking to Saul um, about David. Um, and then the reference in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, um, says very similar, very similar thing, but just a little bit different, um, this has a few different, uh, a little bit different dynamic there. Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And that is, that's God talking here now. Um, it's God talking about David. Um, like I said, both of these verses say pretty much the same thing. Um, but I did want to read them both. Just there's a little bit different aspect, especially in this, in this reference here in Acts. Um, and we'll get into that just a little bit later. Um, but tonight I want to focus on what it means um, to be a man or to be a person after God's heart. And obviously we're going to use David as an example here. Um, so what does a person after God's heart look like? Um, to answer that question, I want to get into, I have th- kind of three different things of what I believe it, it means to be a man after God's own heart. Um, but before we get into that, I just briefly want to get into the three things that it doesn't mean. Um, three things that it doesn't mean to be a man after God's heart. <clears throat> Um, the first one here is, it does not mean perfection. Um, it doesn't mean that we're perfect or we're not going to make mistakes. Um, you know, it's interesting to me here that God describes David with this one phrase. Um, he describes his whole life um, with this, this one line. Um, he could have used words like, um, he could have used many different words. He could have, we could read this very differently. Um, it could read, you know, David the greatest king. Um, or David the musician, um, or David the adulterer, um, or David the murderer. You know, it could have said that those were all things that were part of David's life. 
And that's what we could remember him by. Um, but instead it says, David, a man after God's heart. And what, what really, what's awesome to me is it's actually God that came up with this phrase. Um, it's God that gave, that honored David with such a title. You know, what more could you want God to say about you um, than to be say, you know, here's someone that's close to my heart. Uh, many times people are labeled by the wrongdoings they commit. Um, but thankfully, you know, God doesn't see that, doesn't see it that way. At least he didn't in David here. Um, you know, to me, when in this, you know, I see, I see hope. Uh, when I read that, you know, this is what God's saying about David, you know, I see hope in that. I see hope in that, you know, whatever you did in your past um, does not have to be that one line that describes you. Um, your failures in your past um, doesn't have to define you. Uh, I think it is important um, to say here that although David wasn't perfect, um, you know, we know that he was very repentant of his sins. And I think that's a big part of, of why God could say this about David. Um, but from David's life, we learn that we don't have to be perfect um, to be a man after God's heart. Um, it seems David possessed characteristics that override those very ugly stages of his life, um, the very ugly things that he did. Um, like I said, you know, one of these characteristics was that he was very repentant of his sins. When he failed, he was very repentant of that. And he could use kind of these past failures as stepping stones um, to, you know, grow his character and to build his character. Um, it was Chuck Swindoll who said, when God scans the earth for potential leaders, he is not on search for angels in the flesh. He is certainly not looking for perfect people, since there are none. He is searching for men and women like you and me, mere people made up of flesh. But he is also looking for people who share the same qualities he found in David. Um, God is looking for men and women after his own heart. Uh, moving on here, another thing that being a man after God's own heart does not mean um, is that it's not easy living. Um, someone who has no problems, no trials, or an easy life, um, no stress, no pressure. And I don't think that's describing someone after God's heart. Uh, I believe that's maybe describing someone with a heart after, um, after comfort. Um, that's someone who chooses to, you know, never get out of their comfort zone. Um, that's someone who's never going to see the miracle, who's never going to walk on water, um, who will never see the impossible um, because they choose comfort over God's plans. Uh, we know David's life was hard. Um, you know, throughout his life, you know, there was times in his life where he was running for his life. <clears throat> uh, there were times when people made a conspiracy and he, times he needed to fight for his life. Um, I believe we can learn here, you know, being a man after God's heart is not, is not going to be a trial-free life. Um, it's not um, pressure-free or disconnected from reality and problems. Um, another myth about being a man after God's heart is that you're just born that way. Uh, we often use the phrase, someone has a green thumb. Someone that's good with plants, we say they have a green thumb. And I don't know, it's kind of, <clears throat> that saying kind of alludes to the fact that, you know, they don't, that person doesn't really have to grow in that, in, uh, in that skill, or they don't have to develop themselves in that skill. It just, it just happens. They're just naturally good with plants. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not the case here with David. It's not like he was um, just a naturally, he was born and he, he was, here he was, this man after God's heart. Um, he was just a normal person that grew up into a man after, after God's heart. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, the same is true with, you know, Jared talked a little bit about, you know, our other heroes of faith that we look up to. You know, I don't think e any of them were just, you know, born into being um, this great hero of faith. Um, you know, thinking about Elijah just a little bit, you know, God used him in many powerful ways. He did, he did a, lot of, a lot of miracles. And yet in James 5.17, James describes him as a man, to like sub, or a man subject to like passions as we are. You know, in other words, you know, he was just a normal man. Um, he was just, you know, a normal human being. He wasn't um, just simply born that way. You know, the same is true about David and all these other great heroes of faith. Uh, none of them were different than any of us. Um, they were just human, just like any of us. 
Um, but God, God used them in mighty ways um, because they had a heart similar to God, or they had a heart that was near to, to God's heart. Um, getting into the message here, you know, what does it mean, um, based on the life of David, um, to be this man after God's own heart? You know, I talked a little bit about, you know, not, it's not a life of perfection. Um, it's not a life of ease. It's not something you're born into. Um, but I believe, and this is kind of my first point here, um, it starts with being faithful in the little things. Um, you know, being a person after God's heart um, starts with who you are when no one's looking. Um, it starts with the little things. Um, it starts with what you do with the things that most people probably consider insignificant. Um, you know, when you look at David's life um, on the surface, um, there doesn't seem to be much there to impress God. Um, you know, we know he was a nice looking person, but you know, what he did, his job title wasn't exciting. It's not like he had this great resume. Um, he was a very young shepherd boy um, that was just simply taking care of sheep in this little village of Bethlehem. Um, the Bible does say he was keeping his father's sheep. Um, so he was doing this job for his father. Um, and he was doing it well by protecting them. He did a good job in what he was doing. He did a good job protecting those sheep. Um, in Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 and verse 35... Um, it says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept thy father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. You know, David here was doing, uh, was doing a job that you know, I believe no one else wanted to do. Um, you know, we know his brothers and everyone else was out. They were out fighting in battle. They were out where the excitement and the adventure was. Um, but here's David at home taking care of and protecting the sheep. Um, but I believe we can see that this young man had, he had true courage. Um, when he was faced with, with danger, you know, he didn't run away from the lion and the bear. No, no, he ran towards them um, to protect the sheep. He was committed um, to doing, to effectively doing the job that no one else wanted to do. You know, and I think, you know, in our own Christian lives, I think there's a lot of Christians that miss out on this idea. Um, they only want to serve if it's exciting. Um, they only want to, you know, get involved if it's fun um, and that type of thing. Um, but Jesus talked a lot about that. Um, he talked about, you know, seeking the first places. Um, or helping those that can, or only helping those that can pay you back. Um, he talked about not looking for those things that are exalted or prestigious. Um, he even said that in regards to in, to the spiritual, uh, to spiritual spiritually. You know, don't. You know, I think what he's saying is, you know, don't do those things that only make you feel good or bring a sensation to you. Um, don't do those things that only gratify your senses. Um, and on those, only do those things that are exciting. Don't do those things that only, you know, boost your ego. Um, sometimes you've got to learn to do the things that, you know, don't build your ego. Uh, be willing, for God's sake, to do the job no one else wants to do, um, even if it's an insignificant job um, that everyone else maybe considers unimportant. Um, a man after God's heart um, is willing to do whatever it takes. He's willing to get his hands dirty, um, if that's what it takes. Um, he will have the same attitude that Paul talks about in Colossians 3, um, verse 23. He says, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Um, you know, never underestimate what you do. Um, never underestimate what you do in secret, even if it's, it appears to be insignificant. You know, and that can look, that can look, very differently from one life to another. Um, you know, for maybe for you ladies, you know, when you're in the daily grind of life and you're cleaning and mopping and changing diapers and that type of thing, um, you know, no one, maybe no one's looking and maybe no one's thanking you for that. Shame on us husbands. Um, but, you know, God, remember, God is taking notice of that. God does see that. Um, for us as men, you know, I don't know, as we're, as we're in the daily grind of work, um, and maybe, you know, your boss doesn't seem to appreciate what you're doing or, 
Uh, maybe your coworkers don't really seem to be helping out and it feels like you have to do everything by yourself. Um, you know, whatever the situation, you know, do we purpose to um, continue to work at it um, with all our hearts? You know, I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be a trustworthy person um, because God is watching. Um, God does notice the little things and being a man after God's own heart, um, I think, starts with being faithful in those, in those little things. Uh, number two here, um, David was called a man after God's heart um, because he didn't allow fear to stop him from slaying the giants. Um, as I think of, of David fighting Goliath, um, probably my favorite verse in that whole story um, is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37. Um, and it goes like this. David said, moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. You know, I just, I just love that perspective, that confidence, and that attitude that, that David had. Um, you know, David, you know, it's almost like, you know, here's this young shepherd boy that doesn't have an ounce of fear in his body. He's willing to go out there and fight that giant. Um, you know, I believe, you know, that's, I believe David could do that because this is not the first time he faced something like that. You know, maybe not to that scale, um, but it's not the first time David faces this. What you're about to see in the public or in the spectacular, you know, I believe David learned to do in the secret. Um, I think, you know, I think that's a very important lesson for all of us. Um, you know, I can't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm a fast runner, so today I'm going to go run a marathon, and I think I can win. You know, no, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, a marathon's what, 26 miles, I think it is. You know, I might be a fast runner, and I might be a fast runner for that first mile or two, but after that probably first mile, you know, I'm going to look like a really slow runner compared to everyone else um, because I didn't, you know, spend hours preparing. I didn't spend all that time practicing and working on, on building that endurance. Um, maybe to make it a little bit more spiritual, you know, I can't decide that, you know, I can't decide one day that, although I've never witnessed anybody, I'm going to move to a foreign country, and then I'm going to be on fire for God. I'm going to be the best missionary out there. No, no, there again, it, you know, I don't want to limit God here, but it typically doesn't work that way. Um, we need to, you know, prove ourselves faithful in the small things um, that God brings to us so that when bigger things show up, um, we're prepared to face them. Um, the point is here, you know, don't try to do in the public what you don't first do and practice in the private. Um, you know, don't try to get involved with public battles um, if you don't have victory over your own little personal battles. Um, don't try to lead people if you can't lead yourself. Um, I think God probably showed himself, you know, faithful David, to David in the, in the small little every, everyday little things uh, long before David faced these larger things, um, like the bear and the lion and the battle with Goliath. And I think, I think that's such an, an important, uh, that's so important for all of us. You know, the preparation of David uh, for, the, for the public, for the stage of the spectacular, um, you know, it started in the secret. Um, it started in the insignificant. Um, and because of his preparation in the secret, um, he is able to face the giant with confidence rather than fear. He can say, you know what, God, you helped me with the bear and the lion. You're going to come through again with, for me. Um, with Goliath. Um, David had a track record that no one knew about. Um, he, had a per, he had personal victories in secret uh, with the bear and the lion and probably even smaller things before that. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, he was human. I'm sure there were times when he was afraid, um, but he had this track record with God and he trusted God um, and he did it anyways. <clears throat> you know, there's going to be times in life when we face, we face that giant um, and we're going to feel fear. I'm sure David, um, you know, I'm sure we can all relate to that. And I'm sure David could too. Um, but faith is not letting your fears control you. Um, faith is doing things even if you feel fear. Uh, faith is not letting your fears limit you. You know, David, you know, he didn't let his fears, um, he didn't let the fears of other people um, limit his potential. No, you know, his trust was in the Lord, his shepherd. Um, you can turn with me to the familiar verses in Psalms chapter 23. 
Um, very, very familiar um, psalm. <clears throat> I think this psalm here um, kind of gives us a, an insight into why David, um, or where his, um, where his, where he, what he was relying on. Um, psalms chapter. 23 says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me Thy thy rod and thy staff they comfort me thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now I think here David teaches us, you know, this psalm here teaches us that David's reliance was on God. Um, Just like a sheep that that relies on on a shepherd. Um, I believe this chapter here teaches us that the Lord, you know, in verse 1 there it says he's going to fill our needs. Um, in verses 2 and verse 3, um, it teaches us that you know, he's going to provide us with the right opportunities and the right circumstances, um, and he's going to lead us to righteousness. Um, then there in verse 4, um, you know, it teaches us that there's nothing to fear when the Lord is on our side. Um, he, his, leading, you know, his leadings comfort us, and they give us security. Um, verse 5 talks about you know, he's going to protect us, um, he anoints us, and then in verse 6, um, he blesses us. You know, in part, you know, David, I believe, was this man after God's heart um, because, you know, his shepherd was God. Um, and that, I think, you know, can give us courage when, when we take this path that God lays out for us. Um, you know, my challenge here, I guess, is to allow God to be that shepherd in your life. Um, follow him where he leads you. Um, and then thirdly, my third point here, and I believe this is the big reason why David was described as the man after God's own heart. Um, he was obedient to the will of God. Um, going back to that verse in Acts chapter 13 that we started with, um, God says, I have found David a man after mine heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Um, you know, what a statement for God to make about David. David. Um, that here's a man that's close to my heart, and he's going to do everything that I tell him to do. He's going to fulfill all my will. Um, you know, what a statement for God to make, to make about him. Uh, meanwhile, in contrast, uh, we have Saul, uh, who disobeyed God's orders. He stepped out of God's will. He stepped out of, out of his boundaries. And listen to what God says about him in 1 Samuel 15, verse 10 and 11. God says, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. Now here again, what a statement for God to make about Saul. Um, God says, you know, he's turned his back on me. He's not performing my will, and I repent that I even made him king. You know, how sad um, that God had to say that about Saul when he had the same potential, I believe, that David had. You know, David, we, I think he could have been known as a man after God's own heart as well. Um, but that's, that's what God says about him. It repenteth me that I have even made him king. Um, Saul let his heart um, start to wander from God. And as a result of that, he was not paying attention to God's will. Um, he was stepping out of God's will. He was disobeying God's instructions. And I believe that a point we can make here is that our hearts and our actions are are directly related. Um, What's in our hearts uh, flows out through our actions. Um, The Bible has a lot to say about that. There's a lot of um, different verses about that. I'm just going to quickly pull out a couple of them here. You don't have to turn there. Um, The first one is Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. Um, And it says, As water reflects the face, um, so one's life reflects the heart. And that's the NIV version King James says it just a little bit differently, but I like NIVs, it was a little bit more clear. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. You know, we're all all familiar with the illustration of, 
how, how clear, still, smooth water reflects an image. If you look into a clear water, it's going to reflect your face. Um, in the same way, the heart gives us a clear image of who we really are. Um, our actions and the way we live our lives reflects where our heart's really at. <clears throat> um, and then in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, um, the Bible says this, For the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Um, in other words, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Um, our actions and our words here, um, I think, gives us and it gives others um, a, clear, a clear view into our hearts. Uh, so and when your heart is far from God... You know, you obviously your actions won't line up with the will of God. Um, and so, you know, we can see that played out in Saul's life. As his heart began to wander from God, um, his, his actions um, no longer reflected, you know, God's will. And God could no longer use him. Um, and sadly, um, Saul's condition isn't just an Old Testament thing. Um, it's a New Testament. It's in the New Testament as well. <coughs> Um, Paul wrote a letter to Titus and described people with a very similar pattern to that of Saul. Um, in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> now we see kind of the same idea of, of where Saul was at. We see, you know, played out here in the New Testament. <clears throat> in, in, in verse 10, Paul says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. And then dropping down here to verse 15 and 16, he says, Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. You know, as we know, as Saul's heart grew from God, you know, his actions no longer lined up with the will of God. And now here in, in Titus, um, the people that Paul's talking about, you know, they professed to know God. They claimed they were Christians, um, but their actions denied him. You know, they professed to know God, um, but they were rebellious. They were disobedient. Um, they were defiant. They were not listening to God's instructions. Um, God had no use for them. And I think the same for us today. You know, God has no use even today for people like that. Um, but here we have Saul at the end of his rule. God describes as one who has not kept my commandments. And I think, you know, this is important because, you know, Saul didn't necessarily describe himself that way, um, but God did. Um, Saul didn't see a problem, or at least he didn't admit to having a problem. He wasn't willing to admit it. Um, you know, Saul thought, you know, he was God's chosen man. Um, God had chosen him, um, but God could no longer use him. Um, so on one hand, you know, we have Saul with this, with this hard heart um, who God describes as one who ignores my instructions. Um, and then on the other hand, we have David. You know, we know David wasn't perfect. He had sin. Um, he wasn't perfect. Um, but he had this, this soft, pliable, workable heart. Um, and God says, you know, I have found a man after my heart uh, which shall fulfill all my will. Um, you know, David was willing, <clears throat> I believe he was willing to do anything for God. He was, he was willing to do everything for him. You know, and I believe that's, that's a pretty good uh, illustration of what a man after God's own heart is like. A person who is willing to do anything and everything that God wants him to do. Um, and if God wants you to do it, you know, I think we can take heart that we're not on our own. Um, he's going to help us um, if, we, if we ask him for help. <clears throat> David had his heart set to do everything God wanted him to do. You know, and I think that should be a real challenge for us today. You know, is your heart set in complete obedience to fulfill God's will? Um, is your heart set to, to do everything that God wants you to do? Um, another quote from Charles Swindle, he puts it this way. What does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? Seems to me it means that you are a person whose life is in harmony with the Lord. What's important to him is important to you. What burdens him burdens you. When he says go to the right, you go to the right. When he says stop that in your life, you stop it. When he says this is wrong, I want you to change, um, you, you come to terms with it because you have a heart for God.
You know, I believe a man um, or a woman after God's own heart is a person that, you know, if he sees there's something um, or if he reads something in God's word that doesn't line up with his life, you know, he doesn't just adjust the Bible and try to read it a different way. Um, no, he confesses, he repents, um, he changes, he adjusts himself. Um, he will repent where he needs to repent. He will adjust his life to match what God's will is. You know, in other words, you know, I think if for us today, you know, if God says, you know, I want you to, and you can fill in the blank there, whatever that is. Um, you know, if God says, you know, I want you to stop wasting so much time and, you know, especially on our phones and things like that, that's a real struggle. Um, you know, what am I going to do with that? Am I going to, you know, limit my time? Or am I going to, you know, delete some of those things that, you know, steal so much of my time? Um, if God says, I want you to spend more time reading my word, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to spend, are you going to say, yep, that's what God says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend more time reading his word. You know, I think that's what a man after God's own heart is. Um, you adjust your life, your walk, your actions uh, with the will of God. Um, if God says, I want you to start tithing, then you tithe. If God says, I want you to stop stealing, you stop stealing. If God says, I want you to stop lying, you stop lying. If God says, I want you to live your life with integrity, then you live your life with integrity. If God says, I've given you gifts to serve the body of Christ, and I want you to use them gifts to, to serve the body of Christ, then you do it. Um, you know, David, David was a man after God's own heart um, because he had his heart set to obey God's will. You know, whatever the cost. He was, you know, I believe he was, he didn't hold anything back. He was willing to sacrifice whatever it took. You know, what about, what about you and I? Um, is, that, is that something we want? Um, you know, is your heart set to obey God's will? You know, if not, um, what are you going to do to change that? Um, will you set your heart to obey God's will? Um, Jesus said in John 14, verse 23, he said, if any man love me, he will keep my words. And I believe another way we could say that is, if, you, if any man love me, you know, he's going to obey my teachings. Um, he's going to do whatever it is that I ask of him. You know, is that, is that where we find ourselves? Um, in conclusion here, as, as we look at the example of David um, being that man after God's heart, you know, I trust, I trust we can be encouraged in our own lives um, you know, to live a life seeking God more deeply, um, to be more in tune with and to be drawn closer to the heart of God. Um, we know David wasn't a perfect man. Um, being a man of God's heart, own heart doesn't require perfection. Um, David made mistakes. Um, he had to confess sin just like, you know, we do today. Um, we know that to be a man after God's own heart is quite different from a life of ease um, and comfort. You know, we know David lived a, a, a blood-filled life. He was, you know, running for his life. He was, he was fighting in battles. Um, you know, numerous times he ran for his life. Even, even as, in, as a boy, you know, his, his shepherd life was filled with action and continuous pursuit um, to defend his life from wild beasts and men. You know, quite the opposite from a life of ease. Uh, we know that being a man after God's own heart is not something you're born into. Um, it takes time. It's something that you grow into. It takes work. Um, so my conclusion is that a man after God's own heart is this. Um, it starts with being faithful in the little things. Um, it's being controlled by God rather than fear. And it's being obedient um, to the will of God. You know, I think if, I, if we have to sum this up in, in one sentence, it would be David was a man after God's heart because he demonstrated his faith and he was committed to following the Lord. You know, you see... You know, David wasn't just a man after his own heart, um, you know, or just because of his qualifications, uh, but rather because of, because of the Lord's. You know, he, just like any of us, he was a sinner. Um, God continuously reminded of him of that, and as a result, he, he became repentant of his sins. And I don't know, you know, we could get into a lot more descriptions, There's a lot more, you know, especially as we look at David's life, there's a lot more examples of why maybe David was this this man after God's own heart. There's a lot of other things we could get into. Um, but David's experiences, you know, for us, I think are a constant reminder um, that, you know, really there's nothing we can do um, to be worthy in God's sight. You know, we know our, our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We're nothing. 
Um, but God alone has the power um, to draw us near to his heart um, if we allow him. Um, and that, you know, I trust that's, that's the prayer of each one of us, um, that, you know, we ask God, you know, God, make me more like you. Help me to live out my life and become more like you. You know, I trust that's, that's our desire, that's our prayer. You know, if that's your desire, to be a man after God's own heart, um, I believe, you know, the good news is God is willing to give us that title, um, a man after God's own heart, um, if, we, if we seek that out, if, we, if, if that's our desire, um, he will give it um, to any soul who seeks it. Um, so let's be faithful, um, let's be obedient um, to God's will, um, let's not operate out of fear, let's operate, operate out of faith, and uh, you know, be faithful to the, whatever God asks of us. Um, Jared said we'll, stand, we'll close with a standing prayer, so I guess um, you can all stand um, at this time. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you again for another opportunity to dig into your word tonight um, and study um, what your will is for our life, what your plan is for our life. Um, we thank you uh, for the example of David. Um, help us to um, take what we learned tonight um, as we looked at his life, that, that man after God's own heart. Um, help us to um, be more like David, but ultimately more like you um, as, we, as we desire that, that, that same... Um, that same title, a man after God's own heart. Um, that's what we want. That's our desire. Um, help us to seek that. Um, we know that um, you can help us in that. Um, help us to be committed to serving you. Help us um, to um, not be fearful um, that we could live our lives in faith and help us to you know, be committed to serving you, um, whatever that looks like. Help us to, um, to be like David, to be willing to sacrifice it all um, for your cause. Uh, we bless each one here tonight as we go about our week today, this week. Um, just bless each one. Help us to be faithful to your call and live out um, your life that you have for us. Uh, we thank you that you promised you're going to go with us, you're going to help us, and we praise, that, praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.